This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to Better Love and Sex with Davey Ward, exploring ways for you to awaken, heal, and transform your relationships in and out of the bedroom. Are you looking for practical tools to create more connection, passion, and pleasure in your life? Get some right now with your host, Davey Ward. Everyone, welcome to Better Love and Sex. I am your host, Davey Ward, and I am very excited to be here with you again, starting off the week, having another amazing conversation about how you and me and all of us can begin creating more love and better sex in our lives. My new favorite saying that I made up is, uh, happy people make a happy planet. And I believe that love and sex are two areas that have a profound impact on our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health and well-being. And if we can find ways to cultivate those two areas of our life, they will flourish and grow and blossom and positively impact every other area of our life. So today on our show, I am stoked out to have sexual researcher Art Noble on the show, and he is going to tell us about female ejaculation. And he, I've, I've read a lot about it, and I've experienced it a lot myself. It's one of my favorite things to do and uh, teach other women to do. It's, it's a fabulous thing, very freeing, very fun. There's nothing quite as, as freeing as, as, as having a, an ejaculatory orgasm. It's very liberating, emotionally, spiritually, and physically um, and uh, if you haven't had this experience we have some I have some tips for you at the end of how you can begin cultivating this experience for yourself um, so art art is amazing because he, he after all the research that I've read uh, he he's got some stuff that that I didn't even know about that a lot of people didn't know about and art says that there's actually four sources of what he calls female orgasmic emission which I can't wait to hear more about and he also cites references to female ejaculation in the Bible, that which totally blows my mind. So um, I can't wait to hear more about that, and I'm sure you're just on the edge of your seat. You can't wait either. So uh, I'm going to share some more about who Art is and where he comes from and what he does. Art Noble is an author, speaker, and former radio host on Women's Radio Network. He brings information on our sexuality to millions all over the world. The new messenger of sexual love. That's Mr. Art. Art is the author of The Sacred Female, A Sonata of Sexual Love and Spirituality. And I've, I just have to say I'm in the process of reading this book. And there's a whole lot about female ejaculation in this book. And it's, it's, a be- it's like a story of magic of how awakening to our orgasmic potential um, uh, allows us to access magic, the magical, our intuition, the flow, the divine flow of the universe. Beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, and actually, two lucky listeners, we have two lucky listeners today are going to receive a free copy of The Sacred Female. So in order, if you are interested in receiving a free copy of this book, which I highly recommend, uh, give a call into the studio and we will take your name and your email and we're going to do a drawing at the end of the show and we will email you a copy of this book. So back to art. Um, this is This novel, Art's Novel, The Sacred Female is based on Art's unique experiences, experiences he later learned are shared only by a few. The purpose of the novel is to open ourselves and be not just happy, but joyful with these new experiences. In addition to his experiences, far beyond modern sexual science, Art researched sexual science, microbiology, ancient sexual history, and many fields pertaining to our sexuality. 
All of this gives him a broader view of human sexuality than most, and I would have to agree. He offers a comprehensive, non-threatening program revolving around love, and particularly sexual love. Thank you so much for being here, Art. It is my pleasure, Davey. It is my pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I would love for you to share a little bit about what brought you in. What started you studying sexual biology and erotic love? What, uh, what, what sparked your interest there? Well, <laughs> I'm a guy. All right. Bottom line, <laughs> I'm a guy and I like sex. I mean, what the heck? But then I screwed up. You know, I fell in love with a woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, big time. When when I told this woman I loved her, I felt it in every mm. part of my body. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this was, yes. I didn't know exactly what was going on at the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm a guy. I'm dumb about these things. But uh, whatever it was, boy, I sure it, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And then the, the sexual experiences with this woman were <sighs> fantastic. What I finally you know, after years of study, I figured out, oh, these are transcendent experiences. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And do you think, I, th- I have a question for you based on that. Do you think that transcendent experiences that we that we need to have love in order to access these transcendent sexual experiences, that love needs to be part of the equation? I, I can't say. It was in my case. Here's the mm-hmm. problem. Here's the problem, Davey. There are seven, seven and a half billion people on this mm, planet. Good point. Okay? And even science, uh, like, for example, Janini's report on uh, urinary bladder discharge uh, is one woman. Mm-hmm. One woman. Mm-hmm. Out of, you know, that's a very tiny population. Yeah, uh, small se- <laughs> segment. One. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and this is where sexual science is. I mean... Uh, we can, they do experiments on two or three hundred women. There's still three and a half billion women on the planet. So right, we, right. I can't, I can't say that. All I can say is that in my case, it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know about others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, now, that's a wonderful point. That's a wonderful point, Art. So why did you write The Sacred Female? What was your inspiration for that? Well, one of the problems is that... Uh, Men, a lot of men are, I won't call them men, I think they're just little aged little boys, are, mm. uh, <coughs> are trying to put women down for this. Mm, mm-hmm. And, I mean, one woman told me, uh, she was 83 years old, and she said, uh, I always knew there was more to it than, than what I was experiencing. Mm-hmm, and, then, mm-hmm. and then another woman told me, that her husband forbade her from ever doing that again because she left a bigger wet spot on the bed than he did. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, you know, big-time ego. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then there was a guy that told me, ooh, that's yucky. I said, well, what about yours? You know, mm-hmm. what about yours? I mean, you do it. Why shouldn't they? We mm-hmm. both have prostates, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and uh, it's what I was after, what I'm trying to, to get at is that acceptance of a woman's sexual responses mm. is a part of loving that woman. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would I would have to also say I would corroborate that. So it sounds like um that you your desire with your teaching and also with this book is to educate people about female ejaculation and what it is and that it is this amazing, you know, glorious and very natural response of a woman's body. And I can say from my own experience, I had uh, when I was in my early 20s, I had one partner that I ejaculated with and I had no idea what it was. I thought I was peeing on him and he thought. He thought that I was peeing on him, and he and I had never given it much thought. I just, you know, like I had, I had had it uh, had an experience like that with uh, a previous boyfriend, and he he didn't think anything of it, and he watched a lot of porn, and so he kind of knew what it was. But I really didn't have any understanding of what it was. But I figured if he didn't mind if I peed on him, then that I wouldn't mind if I peed on him either. Okay. But then fast forward a few years to this one boyfriend that I had, and he got really angry with me for urinating on him, even though it wasn't urination. 
Right. And he oh. screamed. He screamed at me. Screamed, <laughs> yelled, and in that moment, I I shut down. And that was when I was twenty three, and I never had another vaginal orgasm until I was thirty three years old. Oh, exactly. And here's the thing, Davy. Our mind, our mind is the most powerful. One of the most powerful things in the world. And I believe that we are subjects of operative conditioning. Yes, absolutely. That's the bottom line. But anyway, uh, back to this, you know, we need, we as men need to accept and encourage uh, our women to have these responses. First, now, now, you know, I'm, I'm a romantic, as a poet, I'm a romantic, but I'm also very pragmatic. Now, in one of uh, Dr. Whipple's books, she points out that women who ejaculate, and this is strictly a urethral e- ejaculation, uh, they seem to have fewer incidents of urinary bladder uh, and kidney infections. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. In other words, it's like guys say, you know, we're blowing the tubes. We're cleaning the tubes. Well, mm-hmm. women are doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. So let's let's let our listeners know, because that's the thing. Most people don't understand what female ejaculate is. That's why we think it's pee, because in all honesty, you know, I've been ejaculating pretty much by choice for the last five years. And to this day, it still feels like I'm going to pee. So I don't even yes. bother trying to convince myself that it's not pee. I just know that I know that it's not pee, but it still feels like it, it feels like I'm going to pee. And so I just let myself pee, even though I know it's not pee. So, okay. <laughs> so right, let's first, let our let's let, let our me, listeners know what it actually is. If it's not pee, then what the heck is it? And why does it feel like we're going to pee? Why does okay. it feel like pee? Well, all right. First of all, we're going to look at two sources uh, involving the urethra. All right. And the first is the female prostate. Now, the female prostate was formerly known as periurethral glands or skein's glands, and I hate to use the word skein's glands. But anyway, the female prostate is composed of oh, many little glands surrounding the prostate, uh, surrounding the urethra, with mm. up to 200 or more various ducts going into the urethra. Now, now, as these ducts become engorged with prostatic fluid, okay, you may have the sensation of needing to urinate. Uh Aha, because it's putting pressure on the urethra. Urethra, right. Now, here's the next thing. Uh, The second form of urethral ejaculation is from the urinary bladder. The same place our pee comes from. Now, the mechanism for uh, urination, okay, is simply a pressure differential formed by the, the accumulation of fluid in the bladder. Now, in the case of uh, orgasmic emission, this fluid is not urine. Now, they have analyzed it, okay? I like to, <laughs> I'm a guy. I like to look at this as, you know how you girls are always talking about water retention? Yes, yes, <laughs> well, yes. I, I look at this as a good way of getting rid of it, see? Ah. <laughs> oh, honey, you look like you've got a little a couple of pounds on you. You want to get rid of some of that water? <laughs> <laughs> You follow what you, I'm saying? I totally follow what you're saying. I'm wondering if that actually works because I had heard you say that before, and that, that actually inspired me to be more proactive about uh, my own uh, cultivating my own ejaculate, ejaculatory orgasms because it was very easy for me to do with my partner, but it wasn't something that I felt very – that I was able to do with myself. So after I heard you talk about that water retention, I was like, well, I'm going to try this and see if I can do it for myself. Um, the other thing that I can say for me from my own personal experience uh, as as I became multi-orgasmic and as I began to ejaculate, I noticed for myself that I my breast size actually increased. I went up two cup sizes. 
Wow. I went from B cup to a D cup uh, <laughs> in these last few years since I've been cultivating my own multi-orgasmic ability. So I don't know if that you know specifically relates, but I would have to say for myself, I know that that it seems seems uh, a natural deduction that as my hormones have become more balanced and my sexual energies have become more balanced, that my that my body and the way uh, my sexual organs in my body has become more balanced and healthy as a result. Yes, I you know the whole thing. See, I'm frugal. Okay, very frugal. And I hate to spend money. And mm. I'm looking at it this way. Uh, a female ejaculation is a hell of a lot less expensive than, than diuretics. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and pleasure, more pleasurable, too, for those. Because we get to have orgasms. Yeah. Those are fabulous. I mean, you know, I'm a, I want to look at this, at all this good stuff, from a guy standpoint. All right? Now, we, we've talked about two of the... Uh, of the uh, sources for female emission. Now, getting back to the first one, on the female prostate, we're only looking at maybe five milliliters or five cc's of, of fluid that, that comes out, all right? And this is a very milky fluid. And then from the other source, from the urinary bladder, well, Janini's experiment is on his one woman and that's in the Journal of Sex Med, uh, December 2011. Anyway, uh, he collected 127 milliliters, which is a little bit more than half a cup. Mm-hmm. Okay? So we got a half a cup of fluid here. Now, here's another thing. We humans are lousy at judging fluids, uh, fluid volumes. I mean, we spill a cup of water, a cup of uh, milk on the floor, and we think we've got a quart down there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's difficult to judge. However, I will say that I have seen a hell of a lot more than 127 milliliters. I mean, enough to soak through three beach towels, a sheet, and and rest on a plastic uh, tablecloth, which is what I recommend. Yeah, and it seems there there's just a copious amount of fluid that yes. comes out. I totally agree. A towel is not going to be enough. I, I usually say get a tarp. Um, so where do, where exactly does, is that fluid coming from? Is it coming from that the is, kidneys? Is it coming from the bladders? It's bladder? coming from the urinary bladder. And ah. I, th- I think now here's here's the uh, here's some speculation. Okay, I think that what is happening is that for some strange reason. The kidneys are sucking water out of the the bloodstream and the Mm -hmm. lymphatic system and processing it into this fluid, which goes into the bladder. Mm -hmm. And then as the fluid increases, the volume of fluid increases, the pressure also increases. Now, Mm -hmm. as the pressure increases, you feel this urge to urinate and boom, boom. When you have your orgasm, you start having involuntary muscle contractions. Now, I have seen this kind of uh, sporadically gush out, okay, Mm -hmm. which is to me, I'm thinking, and again, this is speculation, uh, symptomatic of the involuntary muscle contractions. Mm -hmm. Then there is the phenomenon known as squirting. Mm -hmm. Well, on top of the bladder, there is a muscle sheath called the detrusor muscle. And I'm thinking, and this is, again, hypothesis, not science, I'm thinking that when this muscle contracts, it's, I'm looking at it from a standpoint of an engineer now, what it's doing is it's decreasing the volume of the bladder, increasing the pressure, and therefore it squirts out. Spring out. out. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is that there are plausible biological explanations for all of these phenomena. Mm-hmm. And it's not urine. That's the key. There's no urea oh. in it, no ammonia. So what oh, is yes. what is oh, in yeah. it? Wait a second. Wait a second. There is urea in it. All okay. Right? And, and there was urea in uh, Janini's sample. However, mm-hmm. I was talking with Dr. Whipple this morning. She says there's a review of uh, the literature on female ejaculation and I am under the impression that subsequent, in other words, okay, so 
you had an orgasm, you ejaculate. The next orgasm that you ejaculate on, there's going to be less if none if any. Now, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and that is only a small quantity of urea, and it does not have the ammonia smell of urine, nor the taste, I might add. Now, anybody that has a male child probably knows what urine taste smells like. <laughs> Yes, changing, you're absolutely... Changing Sorry, diapers. <laughs> it only happened once, but that was enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we're actually, we're going to take a break in okay. just a second here. And when we come back, I want to know more about these other two sources. So we have the female prostate, we have the urinary bladder, we have the vaginal ducts. And uh, the other, the other, um, where did you say the uterus? So I want to yeah. hear how all that works. And I'm also super curious about the references to female ejaculation in the Bible. So this is okay. so fascinating. Thank you so much. And we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Hey there, we are back. We are going to go into more detail here about uh, female ejaculation. And so Art, please shed some light for us on these other two sources besides the female prostate and the urinary bladder. I want to hear about it. Okay. First of all, let me say very clearly, there is no science on these other two sources. This is strictly anecdotal evidence. Okay? Okay. And I have to I have to be be care be careful because Dr. Whipple said she might be listening in today. <laughs> she is listening in. Yes, oh. I see her right now. Oh, great! So anyway, <laughs> I have to make that very clear. Now, one of the sources is possibly ducks coming from somewhere in the vagina. All right. Now, women have told me that they can feel this squirting inside their vagina. One woman told me it felt like she had a pinhole leak in her urethra. All right? And uh, the duct, of course, is just just the opening there. So where is this tube going to? Is it possible that it could come from the female prostate and we're getting uh, a little overflow from the prostate into the the vagina? I don't know. It's, Mm -hmm. It's a possibility. But they've mm-hmm. never looked for these ducks, and I don't mm-hmm. know if all women have them. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. I said, there are three and a half billion women on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and it sounds like a lot of the studies that are done on women and sexuality are only done on a very small percentage. You know, like a really small cross section. So it's right. it, results for two hundred people aren't necessarily going to apply to seven billion people. Right now, yes. one of the things that I think it was, uh, oh, who was it? Uh, Perry, James Perry, made clear on the female prostate, is the distribution of the little tiny glands about the urethra is different in different women. And there is, mm-hmm. there, there is a, a, who was it? I can't think of it. It might have been Huffman, said that this distribution is, the, the glands, some of them in some women, they're collected up close to the opening of the urethra. In other women, they're dumbbell shaped, where some are at the opening, some are at the uh, back towards the uh, bladder, and others scattered out in the middle. So all women, here's the thing, all women are different. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. You can't make any uh, judgments, or all, all we can do is make generalities. And the thing mm-hmm. I love about Dr. Whipple's work is that she says the evidence suggests mm-hmm. or that it appears that, you know, mm-hmm. thing, they, she makes those kind of statements not hardcore for every woman because mm-hmm. you're all different. I love it. Now, so do you, it, is it your opinion though, saying that, is it your opinion that most every woman has a G-spot and is able to experience female ejaculation? Is that a natural function of a woman's body, do you think? Can every woman do it? I know women who can uh, ejaculate with only clitoral stimulation. They Mm -hmm. don't need uh, uh, G-spot stimulation to ejaculate. Mm -hmm. 
Aha. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Although I'm not saying it's not a bad thing, you know, but, but uh, it's not. You see what I'm saying? You can't make uh, these hardcore positive statements about you got to uh, you have to uh, stimulate the G spot in order for a woman to ejaculate. Not true. I've seen different. Not necessarily true, but but the question remains: Do you think that every woman is capable of ejaculating? Do you think that? Do you believe? Yes. I, I okay. Yes. So yes. So you think that every woman ha- that it's a natural function of a woman's body to ejaculate? Yes. Yes. Yay. I'll, okay. I'll tell you why. <laughs> and you wanted to know about the Bible, where it's mentioned in the Bible. Yes. Okay. Tell us about the Bible. Leviticus twelve two. It says, now in the King James Version, it says, when a woman conceives a seed and bears a child. Now, uh, Rabbi Seymour Cohen, when he was translating the Igarat HaKodesh, which is a 13th century marriage manual uh, for producing learned sons, he translates that from the original Hebrew as when a woman has an emission and conceives a male child. Okay? Of course, male children, you know, in our patriarchal society, that's the way it goes. However, it was the emission, the the word emission, that got me Mm -hmm. turned on. Now, Mm -hmm. when I figured this out, I called a bunch of rabbis to see if that was the translation, if that was what it meant. And... (laughs) Most of them said, oh, no, no, it's something else. And But a, one said, oh, yes, we've known about female ejaculation for thousands of years. Now, it was believed that female ejaculation was necessary for conception. Now, that isn't the that female, something? The female ejaculate carried a seed, Okay. And the male sperm carried a seed, and these two seeds got together, and that's how babies were formed. And this is possibly true in other cultures as well as the Hebrew culture. Now, that that was written, of course, or or came to us from Moses, and uh, so that was around 3000 B.C. Then in 400 B.C., uh, Hippocrates... The, the Greek physician, came up with the two-seed theory. Well, I, I can see Hippocrates sitting in a local wine shop, scratching his head, wondering aloud where what the purpose of female ejaculate is, and a Jewish merchant says, oh, hey, that's simple. It's She's got a seed, we got a seed. So, bingo, Hippocrates comes up with the two-seed theory. Then if you look in the King James Version of the Bible, in 1611, came out in 1611, it says, when a woman conceives a seed and bears a child. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the conception of that seed is on her emission, her orgasmic emission. Now, 1660 comes along. Lewenhook looks through the microscope, and he can see male sperm squirming around there, but he can't see the female seed, okay? Well, I think a lot of guys, you know, in our patriarchal society just blew it off and said, oh, it must be smaller. You know, a woman's seed is smaller than a man's, so he probably can't see it under the microscope because men are so powerful. (laughs) I had no concept that the female egg is 150 times the size of the sperm. But anyway, uh, then, you know, so they just let it go. Uh, But... 1784, an Italian scientist artificially inseminated a water spaniel. And after that, boy, it was all downhill for women. Because uh, by 1800, there were papers coming out, authoritative papers coming Mm -hmm. out, that saying women didn't have any sex drive. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even Mm -hmm. though, even though the malus maleficarum in 14... What was that? 1486, I think it was, uh, said that women that women's insatiable lust is the source of all evil and witchcraft.
craft in the world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's swapping back and forth. But we are believing modern, it was modern for them, uh, authority. Then along mm-hmm. comes uh, craft ebbing in, uh, what was that, 1896, I think it was. And he says that, oh, female ejaculation is a lesbian condition. Well, ah. <laughs> around 1900, women didn't want to be called lesbians. And a right. few few years later, rather than call it female ejaculation, Freud, when he's uh, talking about Dora uh, in, in that very famous uh, essay about Dora, is saying that it's a vaginal catara, which is a discharge rather than... Mm. Because he didn't want to call her a lesbian, and if she was ejaculating, she must be a lesbian. Right, you know? right. So right. what I'm, so operative conditioning over the centuries has mm-hmm. been the the key for uh, knocking women out of having their an ejaculatory orgasm. Now, as you said, and what I've heard from other women, is that the ejaculatory orgasm is eight to ten times more pleasurable than a non-ejaculatory orgasm, as well as if it's coming from the urinary bladder. Um, it, you know, but maybe getting rid of your water retention <laughs> and cleaning the tubes out, as we guys say. Absolutely. So why, given all of that, I mean, and, and perhaps it's it's somewhat obvious, but, but given that, if it is a natural function of a woman's body, why yeah. is it that more women are not ejaculating more regularly? Why isn't this a common thing? Again, I think it's operative conditioning. Mm-hmm. If you ejaculate, you must be a lesbian. Ah, right. Okay. But, but we don't really we don't really equate it with with being a lesbian in this culture, no. right? We equate it more no. with being peeing, right? Like we like I did. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And, and of course, down there is dirty. Right. Ha <laughs> You excuse me. You and I came out of down there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I don't think we're dirty. Right. So you think you think that our cultural conditioning and the messages that we receive in our culture about, you know, sex being something dirty and shameful. And then also, you know, as women, we don't want to pee on our partners. It's really embarrassing. So if we think that female ejaculate is urine, then we're going to hold ourselves back from that and and not allow it to to flow because we don't understand it. We don't understand what it is and we don't understand what our bodies are doing and neither do our partners. No, and that's what I'm trying to do is educate people about this. Now, there is something I need to say about urinary bladder emission. Okay. The bladder is like a wineskin. And if I put red wine in it and I don't drink it all, and then I fill it up with white wine, I'm going to get a pink wine, right? Yes, correct. Okay. The same thing with the urinary bladder. Ladies, please pee before you come. Please go Ah. before you come, all right? So by emptying the bladder prior to engaging in in sexual intercourse, you are assuring that you are not getting too much, at least too much urine in the, or urea, in the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, in the the emission. emission. Now, Janini analyzed it, okay? And he said it's just got all kinds of good stuff in it. Uh, like uh, unused amino acids, which form the protein. I mean, it, this is this is not dirty. This is good stuff. I okay, mean, you know. Sorry, go on. Then, uh, then I was going to say that if we look now and get away from the urinary bladder, go into the vagina, behind the cervix, into the uterus, this, again, from anecdotal evidence only, no science on this, women tell me that they have an emission through the uterus. Mm-hmm. Now, now let's take a look at the downside of that. The uterus and the bladder are pretty close together. And the vagina and the urethra are pretty close together. So, could they be, be mistaking the uh, uh, flu- fluid from the urinary bladder for fluid from the uterus? That's quite possible. In other words, I'm not saying that it's that it's a, a real thing, but until science comes along and says it's absolutely not, I'm going to believe women. 
I've learned too much in, in this mm-hmm. research not to take them at their word until science shuts them down. Yeah, I, you know, and I would have, I really applaud that art because I have to say from my own experience um, in in awakening to my full orgasmic potential, there's so little, so little science around female orgasm and, and even male orgasm and our full orgasmic potential as human beings because it's it's only studied by a few rare individuals in this culture. So I think there's so much more that isn't known than there is that is known. And uh, we're going to take another break right now and hopefully you won't hear me talking to art over my commercial and when we come back uh i am i'm super curious art you said something that really piqued my interest you said there were a lot of yummy good things good chemicals and chemistries in female ejaculate and i would love if you could share some of those with us so we know and do you think it's a good thing to drink so uh when we come back we will hear more from art on that Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Better Love and Sex. And we are going to go right into Art sharing with us some of the some of the consist- constituents of female ejaculate. What is in it? And can you drink it? That's what I want to know. If you get it in your mouth, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Tell me all about it. Okay. Well, now, the female prostate uh, is can be identified easily in that small... Uh, quantity of of fluid that come, milky fluid that comes out uh, with by PSA pos, uh, prostatic specific antigen. However, that is not a part of the normal urinary bladder flow unless a woman is having a retrograde ejaculation from the prostate. Mm. So, in the urinary bladder flow, uh, this buildup. What they have in there are a bunch of electrolytes and unused amino acids, which electrolytes is what we're getting in Gatorade. Now, all right. here's a problem. We humans, all of us, boys and girls alike, we can screw up an anvil with a rubber mallet, okay, and get all kinds of confused. Now, if you if are familiar with the term water sports, uh no. <laughs> okay, this this has to do with urination during sex. And, oh yeah, no, I'm I, and totally some ignorant. people, <laughs> some people even drink urine, you know. But this this is not my bag. But urine on the on the other hand contains a lot of toxins. I mean, that's mm. what it's for to clean toxins out of our body. But this stuff, this ejaculate, like I say, it's got electrolytes and amino acids and all kinds of good stuff and a little bit of urea but um, at least the first one so i i would it doesn't bother me so i that's what i my opinion but again that's only an opinion and that has to be up to the individual now when we get to the fourth source which women tell me is their uterus okay which makes sense in a way. What they are building up in there, I don't know. There's no analysis. So if there is an uh, an emission from the uterus, an orgasmic emission from the uterus, I would surmise, and again, this is speculation, that is something like amniotic fluid. Mm-hmm. Now, amniotic fluid is what keeps babies alive, keeps the fetus alive. And there's mm-hmm. nothing bad in that. Um, mm-hmm. The the uh, it now instead of having unused amino acids, it has full body proteins in it. Wow! Okay? Wow! So then it would be regenerative to the body to ingest yes. this type of emission. Yes. 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 Yeah. And so I yeah, think so. I think so. That's an opinion. Okay. That's an opinion. There's yeah. no science on that, but I think so. And again, I need to make it clear that is an opinion, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I 
think it's a good one, but <laughs> of course it's good. It's mine. You know? <laughs> well, there's no, I would like to say that there's no modern science on it. Actually, in Taoist sexuality, they talk about uh, the different emissions uh, from women. That, uh, as she reaches different levels of orgasm, her body creates different secretions and different emis- emissions. And they do talk about emissions from the uterus and that these are particularly life-giving and life-enriching, containing many hormones and vitamins even yes. and chemicals that yes. uh, if ingested will uh, regenerate yes. regenerate the body well, uh, body the, mind and spirit I think it is still funny that the ancients knew more about our sexuality than we do without having all of the, the quote scientific knowledge <laughs> Absolutely, I, I and I love I love the two together. I love where the ancient science and the modern science uh, intersects, and where they That's... they actually validate each other. I, I love that. I love that. Yes, I do. So. Too. We're going to talk a little bit, so just to, to give uh, listeners a chance, if you want to know um, more about female ejaculation and how you can experience this for yourself, because it's an amazing thing. And and um, I know for myself, like I shared my story earlier where I was blocked, where I literally was blocked because of a past negative uh, experience, and I stopped having vaginal orgasms. And then um, I, in one session... With uh, with my tantric partner Jacques Druin, I went from non orgasmic to multi orgasmic in one session, quite literally, and uh, became uh, fully uh, multi orgasmic and began ejaculating regularly uh, within a few more sessions. And so, if you want to know more about that, I am going to direct you to our website, betterloveandsex.com, where we actually have a detailed video instruction of how of the process that we use to take uh, women from non orgasmic to multi orgasmic. So you can check that out at betterloveandsex.com, and we actually have a few special deals for our listeners, uh, betterloveandsex.com forward slash deal if you want to check that out. Uh, we have some trailers, video trailers, to give you an idea of what the videos look like. Um, and I invite you to learn more and start awakening and cultivating this type of experience for yourself because it's healthy. It's emotionally healthy. It's physically healthy. And it's sexually healthy. I mean, the more educated we can be about our sexual functions, the more relaxed we can be about them, and the more we can just let the body do its thing and take us to these amazing transcendent states of ecstasy, which is our birthright, sexual pleasure and bliss is our birthright as human beings and the more educated we can be about how to achieve that um, the more we become empowered in our lives um, so I think it's uneducated <laughs> I think we're edu- I think we're educated with a lot of misinformation and disinformation and the objective is to get uneducated and back to our natural state Hallelujah, brother. I hear that. Absolutely. And you had shared that you wanted to talk more about love and the quality of love, because this isn't just about sex. This is about love. So what have you got to say about love? Okay. Uh, Yeah, it took, I started studying sexual science with, with, uh, Dr. Whipple was giving me all kinds of good stuff on, on sexual science, but it wasn't explaining things like the transcendent experiences that I was having. Mm-hmm. And finally, I got a book by Jenny Wade called Transcendent Sex. And the bottom line is transcendence is simply altered brain chemistry. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right on. Okay, n- yeah. now, now, what's happening here is it, it's a function that, that allows us to perceive different things. Now, transcendence, Jenny Wade talks about uh, a dozen different types of transcendent sex. And women, a lot of women are having transcendent sex because you guys, it seems like you're, you're easier to, to give and receive love than guys are, okay? Mm-hmm. So th- that's just a, an observation that I don't know has anything to do with it. But anyway, in Dr. Jenny Wade's book, she says it's nothing but brain chemistry. Well, where does our brain chemistry come from? from our genes that manufacture amino acids which get changed in proteins of various kinds, hormones, enzymes, uh, uh, neurotransmitters and neuroreceptors, and structural proteins. So anyway, I'm looking at it. I'm going back down into genetics then to, to pick all this stuff up. Now, Dr. Bruce Lipton, okay, has come out with the biology of belief. 
which essentially says that what happens to us is that our belief system creates uh, different, uh, in ourselves, creates different responses, okay? And if we, if a woman believes that sex is strictly for procreation and not for pleasure, and it's wrong to have pleasure, she's not going to have any. I don't care how you treat mm-hmm. her, okay? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's our mind. It's our mind. Mind over matter. Yeah. So, yeah, I hear that. And so our bodies are very receptive to what our minds are telling us. And, of course, the mind, I look at the mind as the operating system of the brain. The brain is the hard, the hardware, the central processing unit, and the mind is the operating system. And we've got a lot of viruses in our minds mm-hmm. when it comes to our sexuality. That is an awesome analogy, Art. That is a fabulous analogy, and I totally agree. It's you know, what we think and feel absolutely affects our physical form, um, and our emotions affect our physical experience. Often, I think any any body worker will agree. Uh, we yeah. hold emotional tension in in our bodies. It's just a fact. Right. And right, absolutely. Yes, yes. And uh, this this whole thing. Now, your tips. Uh, you know what I'm trying to do. My my stick here is to show people that this is a natural response. Oh, by the way, if I ever use the word normal, please hit me with uh, 27 lashes with a wet noodle and stop. All the way all the way from here to Florida. I'll try. I'll come to Florida just to whip you with a wet noodle. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, but anyway, at least metaphorically. Uh, but anyway, um, we have we, we're we are so powerful when we're in our natural primal state. And I believe, and we're talking about love now, I believe that love, I, I couldn't figure it out any other way. Love has to be some sort of energy spectrum. Yes. Of which, of which erotic love is only a small segment on the spectrum. Okay? Small but powerful. And it's powerful because of the passion that we as humans can exhibit with our beloved. Okay? This, this energy, I believe, can enhance or modify our, our, gen, our DNA coding to produce the experiences, the transcendent experiences. This is this is what I, you know, this is just again a supposition. It's there's no science on it. Now there's science on taking LSD to have uh, psychedelic experiences and other drugs, and there's uh, uh, some natural drug occurring in South America that they use for these experiences. We don't need them. We mm-hmm. can have them with love. Okay. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. a much more pleasant experience and there are mm-hmm. many other things that happen now i've been accused of having a hallucination on this one but during orgasm just before a transcendent experience my beloved glowed like a light bulb or a firefly this wasn't just that look of contentment that we see then we say oh you're glowing no this was photons being emitted from the skin. Now, it took me years to find out about this, and I had to go into shamanic practices to learn about it. And it's called, it's a breathing technique, a shamanic breathing technique that allows this bioluminescence to occur. Well, (laughs) now, let me finish, let me finish here. Adenosine triphosphate is an energy carrier, both in fireflies and in us. It carries the energy that we've created by breaking down food from one place in our body to another. All right? What happens is this adenosine triphosphate gets super oxygenated, and the cells get super oxygenated. The adenosine triphosphate with the breathing, okay, it gets overloaded. I mean, again, this is a supposition 
gets overloaded with energy, and it's given off as photons. Okay? This is, you know, again, I'm looking for biological explanations where there are none in science, so I have to come up with them. You, you follow what I'm saying? I but totally do. And that is, you know what, Art, that is so awesome, and I would love to have you talk about it more. We have literally like 30 seconds before they close out the show. I want people to know where they can get a hold of you and where they can get a hold of your very awesome book that talks about female ejaculation. So can you give your website, please? www.thesacredfemale.com, and you are sacred. All right, and then people can pick up a copy of your book if they're not one of our lucky two winners. They can pick up your book on uh, where? Amazon and where else? Smashwords. And your website, right? They can go to www.thesacredfemale.com and pick up a a copy of your book there. Right, I'll send them a PDF file. Boom, just like that for four ninety nine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Art. It has been an honor, and I would love to have you back on the show to talk about this bioluminescence, et cetera, et cetera, phosphorus stuff that you were talking about. It sounds yeah. fascinating. <laughs> I want to know how to glow in the dark. So thank you all so much for listening to the show, and we'll see you next week. Uh-huh.